All right, going back to the broom scene, you talked about that scene being choreographed. But uh, choreographed is, is an interesting term. How did, Would the director tell you what moves to do, or they just set up the shot and, and told you to do what you do best in that scene? No, I, I'm sorry. The broom scene wasn't choreographed. It was okay. staged. Staged, okay. It, yeah, it was staged. I mean, as far as the positioning and where, where okay. they would want me to start from point A to point B, but mm -hmm. it was a, it was basically... It started off as a wide shot where the camera guys are just across the street, and uh, they just let me do they, they they let me do my thing. But Hyman Rogers, he he told me years later. He said, "Yeah, he goes, he goes, uh, I just uh, let you do your thing." He goes, "I knew, he goes, I knew that there were certain things that I wanted to enhance your your solo." Mm -hmm. And it, what's really interesting about the broom dance, it came about because I was during our break. They knew I was going to have a solo in the scene but they didn't know what I was going to go I mean what I was going to do hmm. so I was messing around with my with, with the broom they said well can you dance or can you do something with this broom let's see what you got so in rehearsal you know I was like okay I, I never really worked with props or anything but mm -hmm. I was like alright well I was messing around with the broom for the director and Jaime Rogers said said that's it I, I was like what he goes what you just did I balanced the broom on my on my finger I just turned the broom upside down and I was balancing the broom on my finger and as I was balancing it I was doing the float you know I was mm -hmm. I was moonwalking and I'm floating in a circle and they said that's it they said if we could just they said if we could just play this up and add a little more Hollywood magic to it you know, it'll come across. And so they had a, a prop guy take a drill bit and drill through the uh, the broom and put some fishing wire mm -hmm. through the broom. And they 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 told me to to uh, put the put the broom put the I mean the fishing string. You know, the string that they right. use for fishing. Right. They, they once they drilled the hole through the broom, they put the string on my hand and they said, okay, let's see let's see you do some stuff. You know, with the broom doing this and then. Then they had another broom where they put a, a metal L-shaped piece underneath the broom bristles mm -hmm. so that uh, it was in the L shape so that when the broom was laying down on one scene, I would go over to it and I could step on, I could step on the little metal piece that's inserted inside the broom and the broom would raise up from the floor. Right. So those two, those, between those two props, it helped give that whole effect and made made my whole solo a piece, mm -hmm. which I'm really thankful to Hyman Rogers because I mean, usually when you go to a theater play, or you uh, you go you know and you see a a solo dancer do a piece, you know it's staged with props. And what he did was he made I mean we made history, you know, having mm -hmm. that so room scene staged. And um, at the time, we were dancing uh, to you know funk and electronic type of music and so uh it was only natural that uh that they tailored uh the song uh Tour de France mm -hmm. to my dance because if you listen to that song it has kind of like these oriental chimes mm -hmm. we had just got off a Japanese world tour of Lana Richie so it has this kind of Kyoto kind of Japanese uh uh string progression in, in the mm -hmm. background and in the beginning of Tour de France it it has this breathing right. which kind of showed the you know the the stamina part I mean the exasperation of of how how much stress we were putting on my I was putting on my chest as I was dancing the breathing the, ah. yeah. <sighs> you know so it right. was it was that was a perfect song for that song it was perfect who chose it who, who was the person that chose that song well, Russ Reagan, Russ Reagan was the um, the musical. I mean, the guy in charge of the the music. But you know, the directors and the producers they're picking up on everything that we brought when we got on that set, from our clothing to our music. And I think it was one of those things where we had had one of uh, we had our music in our uh, one of the cassettes of of craft work in our in our boombox, and they picked mm -hmm. up on it and got the rights to the song.
Well, you know, craft work has been around a long time, and uh, a lot of us, myself included, uh, I think I first heard of craft work probably in the early 80s, 80, 81, something like that, when I first heard some of their the robot, the model, etc. But really, in my mind, and I think in the minds of many, they exploded on the scene with that scene. And I'm curious, and this is what I ask you in question number five, have you ever had a chance to see craft work in concert or meet these guys, uh, talk to them? Do they, do they know who you are and, and what you did for their music? No, I never met them, um, uh, but I, I would love to. I remember they had the, uh, the song Trans Euro Express. Right. Right. And uh, there was a there was one song we used to dance to in the poppin' circle called Numbers. Oh yes, of course. And uh, I mean that was just like a club favorite. I mean it mm -hmm. was like totally totally appropriate to to popper to the robot to their their, their type of music. So mm -hmm. yeah, we were we were big fans of uh, of craft work, but years later. I never, I never got a chance to uh, to meet them or go to a concert or anything. And it would have been, it would have been nice to to uh, maybe be a guest when they perform somewhere. <laughs> like, there he is. Exactly. That you know that that's exactly why I asked you because I first saw them perform in 1997. They had, they had stopped touring for many many years, and finally I got uh -huh. to see them in the 90s. And of course, when numbers is playing in in Tour de France, a lot of people around me were all talking about you know. I don't know Michael Boogaloo Shrimp Chambers would come out right now in the back of the stage and start doing something. How magical would that be? And we always asked ourselves, did you know each other? Have you ever met each other? And uh, now we know the answer. Yeah, I know. And you know what? Years later, that has been like my my version of Billy Jean, meaning every time people thought of Michael Jackson for years after his performance, they wanted to see him do Billy Jean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Billy Jean, Billy Jean, do the moonwalk. And so... My my version, my theme song was Tour de France. Everywhere I went, whether it's house parties or, or gatherings, people would put Tour de France on and assume that I would dance to it. <laughs> I had been just kind of just like, it was like overkill. I, I hear right, that of course. So much that there's, <laughs> there's other songs that would motivate me to to uh, go out and do other solos. But yeah, that was, uh, right. that was uh, I, I really, I really liked the fact that I was, uh, dancing to their their music because they were uh, they were an underground band and a lot of people didn't really know them right. until until that that film came out yeah and now now they're getting the proper respect uh due to them a lot of people are finally recognizing you know these 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 german guys <laughs> as being one of the founding fathers of hip-hop oddly enough so many yeah. times i think i saw somewhere they and and, and james brown are the two most sampled artists in uh, hip hop history, so that that says a lot about what they're able to accomplish. Um, That's amazing. It is amazing. Let me go back again to uh, the broom scene one more time because you mentioned something in the YouTube uh, video that I'm sure many people have seen, where you're describing the broom scene, and you tell us that the the, the fishing line that was attached to your fingers was meant to be seen. Now, was that true? Was it really meant to be seen by the audience, or was that just a mistake of lighting? No, no, that that. I think that they they deliberately uh, they deliberately left that in there to show that it was a piece because it, mm. it wasn't it was it wasn't a special effects film it was just uh, straight up dancers doing doing uh, doing what they do and having a guy like Hyman Rogers be the person who staged it I think in the back of his mind he was like you know what leave it in there so that people could see it's not the prop it's what he did with the prop. Nice. Which gives a, it gives a broom scene a little more credibility as opposed to some Hollywood uh, some Hollywood tactic to you know dress up a dance sequence. I mean, you, a lot of times anybody can do anything with special effects, mm -hmm. but uh, you know having those really uh, those really cheap props or whatever it it gave it it just gave more credibility to the piece and to the dance. Well, from a fan's perspective, and the reason I ask you this is because, uh, you know, being a kid watching Breaking, we, we, we kind of like the fantasy aspect just a little bit. We like Turbo being just a little bit magic. You know, he can make brooms float when no one's around. He can climb up walls yeah, yeah. when no one's around. So when we saw those strings, we were like, oh, couldn't you just leave that out and let Turbo be magic just for a second? 
And we can go back to reality later. So that's the reason I asked you that. A lot of fans yeah. think that way about and it. And you know what's really interesting? I 